the bar and down. What a shot! All right, guys, we now welcome on a very uh, bright and experienced hockey mind, author of two great books, uh, two that we have here, I should say. Uh, when every team needs to know to create a championship culture and think like a fan, investing in your fans so they invest in you. He's also created multiple companies like We Live Hockey, a hockey storytelling network and community, uh, hockey wraparound. KP, you just ordered some of it. The Game Seven Group. So, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Elias or Elias, what's up, man? Yeah, what's up, buddy? No worries at all. Like it's a common problem, man. It happens we all the time. just had this conversation where I said it's not <laughs> it's okay. Elias because I'm a Philly fan, and then that got in my head because the first yeah. time we got on here, I said Elias, right? And you're like, yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it was a little bit of a funny life growing up in Philadelphia with the same last name as the all-time Devils leading goal scorer, um, and then getting asked everywhere and every rank, "Hey, are you related to that guy?" And I, I eventually I started thinking like maybe I should just say yes, yeah, but no, yeah, it's a lie. But that's okay. Listen, I don't mind. It's, well, the, the problem fact is, that I never would have thought about it that. until you told me not. That's not it. Because <laughs> the, I oh, immediately you're blaming me of, now. I, I see how this think goes. Of, like, okay, Elias sportsbook, <laughs> like that type of thing. I'm like, All right, yeah, Elias. That, that's. That's the alternative one. Yeah, it, it, it's a rather well-known name, surprisingly. It's just not common, but people know it, I guess, from the uh, famous people that have had it. Right. So like we just said, we got, you, you've got a couple books. You've got plenty of companies, but let's first learn about you. I mean, you've coached at the collegiate, the professional level. I mean, you've been doing it, I think, hardcore since you were 22. You got such a yeah. crazy experience. So let's just go into your playing and coaching career and how you got started in the sport of hockey. Sure. Yeah. I'll give you like the two minute drill. Um, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I played all of my youth hockey out here. I uh, started when I was 12 years old, so a little later than most, but uh, I found a knack for it. Uh, I loved skating. I remember when rollerblades came out um, sometime in the mid nineties, like I, my mom got me a pair and I could just do it. Like I never had to get taught how to skate, um, which was a gift. And I'm so thankful for that gift to this day. Uh, so it was funny because from 12 till 18, I never played on the same team twice. Uh, and it, not cause I'm bragging, but I, I was advancing so quickly. I was jumping up levels. And by the time I got to college, um, I got to go to Montclair state university, um, won a collegiate championship there in my freshman year. Do I have a championship? Um, or- hmm? It was, yeah, it was a, a Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Hockey Association nice. Championship. Yeah, nice. so we won that my uh, my freshman year, which was 2002, 2003, um, and played there for a few years. And then uh, shortly after college, I uh, had a very, very short stint uh, trying out for the SPHL. I got to train with the New Jersey Devils a little bit during that time in 2005 during the lockout, which was was an experience. Um, you'll, you'll see how the story starts with me. Uh, I still am a, a big Flyers fan, but uh, as I've grown up <laughs> – uh, you know, I've become more of a hockey league fan right. than just the Flyers. Right. And so I grew up hating the Devils, and the Devils ended up giving me more opportunities than any other team in the league, <laughs> which is always always funny. But, um, yeah, so I, I that was 2005. And then uh, shortly after that, um, my alma mater, Montclair State, needed a new coach. Uh, and the, the, the team was in deep trouble, and they were about to get kicked out of the school and everything. They were on probation with the league. And I kind of jumped, put my hat in and got the job. And I was only 22 years old which was, uh, as I'm realizing now, a little older, <laughs> pretty ambitious. Um, but we, uh, we really turned that team around in two years, and they went from 5-25 and 25 to 25-5 and five our first year, uh, really committed to a team bonding philosophy, uh, albeit was very raw at that time. And, again, we're going to allude to that later in the episode, I'm sure. Um, but that was really my first experience in coaching and really realized at that time, you know, a few things. One is that uh, as much as I love playing and I still play to this day, um, I was probably a better coach than I was a player. Um, which was uh, a fun transitional time in every player's right, right. career. Um, but uh, I, I got into that. And then uh, my wife, who was in the United States Air Force, um, we got started getting shipped all over the world. So we got shipped down to, uh, to what, Northwestern Florida. And uh, I, I should have said before that, I, I worked at the National Hockey League in New York City. So I was really kind of working a hockey life. And then the military called us. And we went to near Pensacola, which I call hockey hell. Um, there yeah. is there is hockey down there. Well, it's I, I, it's know, just kind of hell a joke. in yeah. general. Yeah. yeah, it's not a hockey hotbed. I'll put it that way. Right. Uh, and then uh, from there, I got my master's down in that area in, in uh, sports business. And uh, then the military sent us to the United Kingdom, where there is a flourish of professional hockey at a much higher level than anyone realizes. Um, I mean, former NHL players have played in England, and you know it's a good league in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, or Great Britain qualified for the world championships over the last two years. So it's an emerging hockey nation. Uh, and I was hired there as a uh, assistant coach on the Peterborough Phantoms 
uh, club. And uh, I was there as a, as a hockey skills development coach and also the team development coach. Um, and really developed my philosophy fu fully at that time on the importance of team bonding. And uh, that's really what I focus on now in the game is I help teams build the bond that's essential to winning. Um, you know, as I realized as I got older, this is, this is something people kind of know about, but they don't really know the full force of why it's needed, how much time needs to be dedicated to it. And that you literally can't win however you define the word winning um, without it. You know, so I'm not just talking trophies here. I mean, a win could be graduating a high school senior class. A win could be uh, turning your program around from a loser to a winner. Uh, a win could be a championship. It's, it's whatever you want to, to define it as. But um, yeah, I really sharpened my teeth there. Uh, you know, I wrote a book about it, kind of my own personal coaching philosophy and really blessed to have applied that book to, to business and to hockey and to kind of everything that I'm doing today. And then everything came full circle. The, the, we got our time in the military ended and I ended up back up in Philadelphia, which I wasn't expecting to happen. <laughs> so here I am married with my two lovely children, Logan and Alina in Philadelphia, running four companies and playing hockey. Uh, that's why I said I'm very fortunate, very blessed. And I've been surrounded by good people for a long time. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to live a hockey life, really. Sure. So before two we, minutes, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so before we skip over it too much, I mean, what exactly were you doing back with the, when you worked at the NHL? Yeah, so I was the coordinator of programming and production for the NHL Network uh, when they launched the network in the United States. So um, back in 2007, the NHL Network was only available in Canada. Um, and there was an initiative to launch it in the United States. And um, my, my undergraduate degree was in broadcasting. Um, and I obviously had the hockey background. So um, I applied. I was one of 1,500 people that got it. Um, and we launched it in the United States. I used to direct a show called NHL Live, which is uh, still on, but it's, it's much different today. Uh, when I directed it, it was just a simulcast of a radio show with uh, EJ Raddick and Don LaGreca and uh, several other hosts and guests. But uh, that was a privilege. And yeah, I worked at league headquarters right down in midtown Manhattan. And it was a pretty amazing work experience to be at the Mecca. Um, I learned a lot of lessons when I was there too. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, it was very surprising that when I worked there, a lot of the people that worked there really weren't hockey fans. I mean, I'd say half the workforce wasn't really hockey fans, which always wow. shocked and annoyed me. Um, but it, it was a job, right? It was a job in, in New York and it was the NHL. So it was a high profile job. Um, but uh, to be at that headquarters where the Stanley Cup's coming and going, you know, I'm seeing Gary Bettman every day. Uh, players are coming in and out. Uh, it's an experience I've always been thankful for and had a lot of gratitude for. Uh, and it really uh, kind of advanced me on my journey um, at a rapid pace. So, uh, yeah, surreal, but awesome at the same time. And like I said, the time I spent there is not a time I'm going to forget. For sure. I mean, did you get to know Gary at all? I mean, what kind of person was he? I mean, he gets so much oh, flack from fans and the league and everything. Yeah, like I mean... I mean, I didn't go have lunch with him every day or something like that, but right, you know, right. we'd see him in the hallways enough that there was a facial recognition after a while. Right. Um, yeah. yeah I, I always thought that his criticism is unfair. Um, and I, this is going to be the controversial part of the episode, which I love. Hopefully people will comment. Stir the pot. Um, Stir it up. Yeah. No, I, I'm not a Bettman hater. A lot of people hate Gary Bettman and I always ask them why, and I never get a good answer or I'll get like, Oh, well three lockouts and, expansion and i'm like okay well, he doesn't like my team what? yeah yeah it, it, you know it, there's a lot of like criticism that's not really well founded in anything i mean when you look at the business side of the lockouts which we can get into if you really want to um you know he saved the league with the lockout in 05 or, or i should say the owners at him if they didn't do what they did there would not be an nhl in its current form today uh, it would be very different the league was not sustainable um, and what they demanded was not unrealistic when you look back at it in terms of just a 50% revenue share. Um, and then you hear a lot of things like the owners get all the money and the players. It's just, it's never that simple. You know, the, who, ha who people get paid again, we can get into the deep business side of this later if you really want to. Um, and then, you know, the other argument is the expansion and it's, it's, you know, I, outside maybe the Florida Panthers. I mean, most of these teams have worked out and it's a good thing that the NHL has expanded and, uh, the, the roadmap and the, the size of hockey around the country has grown. And you can make an argument, maybe it happened too fast, but, it, but there's fans in, in all 32 seasons coming next year. Um, you know, and, and again, he's done more for the game in a good way than harm. I'm not saying he hasn't done things that I don't agree with. 
But when you look at the broadcast deals and you look at the revenue right, right. and how oh, big yeah. of a league it is today, yeah, it's not comparable to before he took over. Um, you, you could make a very convincing argument that he's done more for the game than anyone in a business capacity. Agreed, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he's a human being. And I'll tell you this, uh, he won't admit this, but big Rangers fans. So so I remember when the Rangers lost to L.A. and people were like, he threw this for L.A.? I'm like, yeah. that's not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> If you threw it, it would have been for the Rangers, but right. uh, no, not a, not a horrendous human being. I'll put it that way. KP, you got anything? Um, I guess sticking with the NHL, like I kind of, kind of deeped into your books a bit. I mean, you bring that team philosophy kind of to the business world. Did you kind of feel that when you worked there in the NHL and the NHL network? Uh, at times. I mean, here's the deal is the NHL is a corporation and they're in the biggest city in the world. So they run mm -hmm, like right. most companies in the biggest city in the world where uh, there's a lot of backstabbing, a lot of front stabbing, and you got to kind of watch your back. I'm just being very honest with you right now. Right. Uh, there's, you know, I, I also worked for member clubs. So I worked for the New York Rangers for a time too. And, you know, I found working for the teams to be much more enjoyable than working for the league. Um, and again, I'm not trying to rip the league. I, oh, I said it before and I got to say it again. I mean, I was really fortunate to even have an opportunity to work there. Yeah. Um, it's just like most things, it's not what you think it would be. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody that wants to work at the league or a team. I think it's an amazing experience. Um, but I think that a lot of my philosophy is probably generated from what I wasn't seeing at places like the NHL. Now, that, the NHL could be a very different work environment today. I mean, when I was there, it was at the height of the recession. It was after a lockout. <laughs> I mean, could, right. You know, it might have right. been a, a, just a bad few, few years um, when I was there. But uh, in terms of the work, right? Like the hockey work. I love every second of the work. Um, cause I was around the game all the time and just constantly not in belief that I was getting paid to do what I was doing. Something you, you uh, love to do. You grew up doing pretty much. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be safe to say that outside of my family, I mean, hockey is you know, the love of my life. Um, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's been with me since I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, again, outside of my family, that's the most important thing to me, but yeah, no, the, the team building philosophy was built really off of, I'd say 20% good experiences, but really 80% bad experiences. And, um, just a continued lack of understanding from coaches and even players on how to be part of a team. Um, I can tell you right now that, you know, the 1980 miracle team really is the, the benchmark that sparked the interest in, in team bonding for me. And I remember back in probably 1998 or 1999, um, I saw the HBO documentary, documentary, Do You Believe in Miracles, which predated the movie Miracle. Um, and it changed my life. I mean, it changed my life. And I, I pursued studying that team. I've read multiple books on that team uh, to understand what Herb Brooks did and how he was able to bring that team together. And that's what spawned my interest. What, what got me going and dedicating my really professional life to that kind of thinking was when I realized people didn't understand fully what was going on with that and that people did not understand fully how to create a team bond and why you need to spend an incredible amount of time doing that. Um, you know, some teams be like, well, you know, we had a, we had a team building session at the beginning of the season. Like that's not enough. <laughs> we worked out together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's just, I mean, that's not enough. And, you know, I'll tell both of you, you know, just quickly, the philosophy with that is, you know, you need three things to win. You need tactics, you know, you need talent and you need a team bond. And if you look at those three things, if you split them up, it's 33.3% for each one. So I tell teams and coaches, you should be spending 30% of your time on this 30%. And they think I'm crazy. Like, well, what about the tactics? What about that? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you don't have this guys. I mean, and yeah, look, some teams can spend less time on it if they're a little closer. But if, if you're not seriously using this, you will not win. And I'll, I'll throw it at both of you, you know, and again, I don't know how many sports you guys have played or, or championship moments you've had in your life, but there's, there's, I've never been on a championship team or moment where I hated the guys that I was there with and I couldn't wait to get it over with. Yeah. I, th you know, I think like, I, I saw a quote somewhere. I, don't, I think you said it, um, or it was in the book where you said, no one's ever won a championship and said, Hey, I hate everybody here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It, it doesn't happen. In fact, it's more like a brotherhood or a sisterhood or right. a family environment. Uh, and you remember these people forever. Uh, and, and again, I do have to say, like, there's a big difference between liking everyone and respecting everybody. Like, sure. I, you know, I'm not saying I've been on a team where every single person was my best friend. Okay, but you respected the effort. I trusted everybody was doing their job. Like, you can't win without that in any environment, any team environment. It doesn't just have to be hockey, right? So, um, 
I realized what was capable and what was possible when team bonds are formed and they're like little miracles. And you know, when I realized that I might be able to help other people get to that point, I decided I'm diving in. This is what I want to do with my life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, well, cause me and KP definitely have a lot of uh, experience with that. We both coach together. We both played together, but what going back, one thing that you said that kind of really interests me was I think I'm a, I was a better coach than I was a player, and I can kind of attest to that myself. I mean, I yeah, I coached prep school hockey. I felt like I was a for some reason I felt like I was a better coach than player. I mean, granted, I wasn't getting going to play for the Devils at any point or doing any type of training camp like that. But, yeah. Uh, what What really made you think that that you were at the end of it? If you look back, like I was a much better coach than a player. What was the biggest difference? Yeah, well, I mean, I had the blessing of it being a, a kind of a mutual time. So, you know, I, I had kind of just tried out for the SPHL, and the SPHL at this time period is really more of a fighting league. Um, and I, I, I just kind of looked into the future. I mean, it's pretty clear I wasn't going to make the NHL, but I had gone farther than anyone had ever said I would. So I was very comfortable with that to a point, I should say. Um, and I just could see that the SPHL life – well, there's nothing wrong with anybody who does that. It was full of injuries and, you know, bad health insurance <laughs> and, you know, just not, not a destination outside playing hockey for a few years, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I was lucky because I got a taste of coaching when I was 22, 23. And right away, uh, we could see the impact of the team building that we were doing as a group. Um, you know, and again, I, I would say I was at the helm of that team, but it, it was a team, right? So we did it. And over two seasons uh, to see the program rev revitalize and everything that was happening, not just winning, but, you know, profiting, you know, the team was making money. Um, you know, I realized like, wow, th there's something I can do here. I'm not going to have to destroy my body, um, you know, and I love doing it. Now, I'll also tell you this, the first year I was coaching, um, I don't have a problem admitting this because uh, I was young, but every single night home on the bus, I cried myself to sleep, like under, under a hoodie. Nobody could see me. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, like, can, I can you know, tell you there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and for those of you listening, you know, when, when you first, it, some of you have been through this, might be going through it or we'll go through it one day. We, we all have to stop playing at some point in terms of competitively. It, it, it could be when you're 18, it could be when you're 40, but at some point you have to stop, right? You're, you, you have to retire or whatever the word is. Um, and I was 22. So I had such a passion for playing and it was coming to the realization of, I love coaching. I'm really good at it, but this also means that my career essentially as a player is, is, you know, you're giving it up. Um, that was very painful for the first year uh, because whenever you're a young coach and you, and you both understand this, you want to be out there on the ice just as much as you're coaching on the bench. You want to play. You want to contribute any way you can. Exactly. Now I'm also happy to tell you guys that the older you get and the more your bones start popping, the easier that gets to handle. <laughs> I, I've never gotten to a point where I've, I've said, Oh, I'm really happy. I'm not out there right now, but right. Uh, I definitely don't, you know, miss waking up with my back being out of alignment. Right. Um, you know, in post concussion problems, which was just a day to day injury back when I played. But um, yeah, it was rough. It was a really rough transition. Uh, but looking back, I'm really lucky that I even got to coach because it kind of accelerated that process. Um, and then I just ran with coaching and, you know, the truth is that, um, I still, again, I still play to this, well, not today, today, cause of what's going on, but I still play today. Like, you know what I mean? I, I'm right, constantly right. playing real hockey. I still on, play on adult league teams all the time. So, you know, um, stay in shape and stuff, but yeah, that was a tough transition. Uh, but I got past it and, you know, the nice part about coaching is you can do that forever, right? You can, there is no time you have to really retire from that unless you want to, because there's no way you can age out. <laughs> you can right. do it until, it, until your little heart's desire. So um, yeah, it, it was just, it was just coming to that conclusion, you know, again, just, just that this could be a future for me and that playing the game is not going to be a long-term future for me. And uh, you know, I took this, took the leap. Yeah. yeah at a, so at a young age, I mean, at 22, how was the team? Did the team respect you at that age? Was it more of like a friend? Did you have to work with friendships there? And then I guess when you got to the pro level, did you have to deal with the, the age factor at all? I mean, you might have to coach some older guys, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I'll, I'll answer them one at a time. So being 22, I'm pretty sure I was like, there's no, there's no statistics on this, but I'm pretty sure I was the youngest head coach in the history of college hockey uh, at that time. Yeah. And that's not a brag. That's awesome. it, well, it you probably happened. got players older than you at that point. Well, it was close. So I had uh, my oldest player on the team was six months younger than me and I had played with him. So he was like a freshman when I left 
the, right. the school. So all of a sudden the captain of the team is a player that has, it knows me as a player. Um, and the way I attacked that, cause I knew that could potentially be a real problem. Um, not to mention there was a ton of pressure looking back on it from the school of just like, well, what are you doing this for? You're just trying to drink and party and spend a few more years with the team. And that's, that's just never been me. Uh, you know right. what I mean? I was never a big party guy. You know, it's just, that's just who I am. Not that, you know, anybody who enjoys that side of the game, that's God bless you, but that just wasn't me. Um, so I had to convince the school that I wasn't doing that. Um, you know, cause they're looking at me like this kid's been legal for a year. <laughs> You've been on this team for however many years. And yeah. So what I did was I was very aware that that was going to be a potential problem. So I held a meeting with all of the seniors and I told them, um, I played with you. We were brothers. I am not your teammate anymore. I am your coach. And if I do this, you're going to have to respect me in that. And I really laid out for them what the plan was and where I was going and why I was doing it. Uh, keeping in mind, again, this team was about to get kicked out of the schools. So they weren't exactly in a negotiating position. Um, so I told them that. Um, and then I introduced myself to the full team. And I was very uh, stern with them that I'm not messing around. This isn't something that's fun. We're turning this around. And I think the moment that really woke everybody up was uh, the top three scorers on the team uh, who were all drunks. I don't know how else to say it. They just, let's just say they enjoyed the excess of college. That, that's college KP hockey. in his glory days. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, that, again, you know, if that's your choice, that's your choice. It's just that wasn't going to happen on my team. So Understand. Um, they kind of tried to cause a mutiny, and they said, well, look, we're not playing if, uh, if this doesn't happen. And I kicked them off the team right away. I said, you can oh. leave. And they did. So uh, that kind of sent a message to everybody. If I just kicked the top three scorers off the team, doesn't keeping matter in mind who you team, are. Yeah, well, there was that. I was like, we're not winning, so it doesn't really matter how talented you are at this point. And people said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, we'll get it in the aggregate. Like, everyone's going to contribute. Everyone has a role on my team. Um, and they did. And, I mean, it was a miraculous turnaround season. Nobody expected us to be where we were. We were nationally ranked. Um, it was a really wonderful time. Um, with the team. And, you know, again, like, like I wasn't, I wasn't perfect. I was, I was really raw. I was young. I made a lot of mistakes too. Uh, looking back at it now as an older coach, things that, you know, lessons I learned at that time that I had done wrong. Right. That, uh, you know, definitely, especially things like micromanaging, like I know how to delegate now and really uh, communicate a lot better than I did back then. Back then I had my hands on everything and that's not sustainable um, for any model. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was how I got their attention. And then, you know, once we started winning, I mean, it, it falls into place. And the team bonding aspect was there from the beginning. I brought in someone from the military to help out with off-ice training. Um, the first practice, you guys want to hear a cool story. The first practice I ever ran, uh, the kids get on the ice. I shouldn't call them kids. The team got on the ice. I have no pucks. And they're looking at me like, well, what are we doing? Where are the pucks? I said, we're not using pucks today. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. I said, very simply, if you can't, skate 60 minutes which is the time of a full game if you don't know what it means to skate a full 60 minutes you're not going to win any games this year so i skated them for 60 minutes three 20 minute periods and i gave them 10 minute breaks between each period right but it's 20 minutes of skating break 20 minutes of skating break 20 minutes of skating break um because I, I i want them to know i want you to know what 60 minutes of effort feels like that was my first practice uh now what shocked me and shows you how bonded this team got was uh, halfway through the season, we hit a little bit of a lull. And the captains came to me and said, we have to do this practice again. Huh. And I was like, you want me, you want me to bag skate you. <laughs> I remember that you want me to do that. And they go, yeah, the guys, they forgot. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing to me that I've never had a captain say, bag skate us. We deserve it. Um, you know, but Damn. that's how close they got. That's how much they bought into this thing. And we did that. And again, we went, we got within one game of the, uh, national championship tournament that year and everything was there. We had the bond. We had good talent. We didn't have the best talent by far. We were nowhere near the most talented team, but when we worked together and the tactics that we had, it worked. And you know, that was really the basis for everything that I did, but yeah, that's how I got their attention um, really quick on the other side of it. So um, in professional hockey, it's a little different. So I, I, coaches at minor to in, in independent hockey, they're probably younger than you think they are. Most of them are 30 to 40. Um, when you look at it, so, um, you're coaching guys that are probably around the same age as you or younger. I did have a few guys older than me, but at that level, when you're getting paid to play, um, there's a, there's a little bit of respect that comes into that, that you, you can only lose that respect, not so much gain that respect. You know, if, if I'm being hired for a professional job, there's a reason I was hired. Uh, and that, that respect goes both ways. If you were paid to play on the team, 
you know, there's an understanding here that you have a job to do as well. So it's a super different dynamic, uh, but you have to bring your A game all the time. That's how you lose respect at the pro level is that, you know, if everyone's given their all and you give 99%, that's not good enough for the team. Uh, and the teams that fail at the professional level don't have that established. Um, and I always say that, you know, when you look at youth hockey and college hockey, coaches are kind of almost godlike, you know what I mean, in terms of like what they say goes, right? Uh, and when I approach the professional level, um, it's not that simple. I think coaches that operate that way tend to fail. Uh, the players are really the gods in professional sports. You know what I mean? Right. And the coaches are their guide. Uh, so you have to have a mentality shift whenever you do pro sports. Um, and, and again, that's not every coach in every league. There are still godlike coaches. I mean, a Scotty Bowman would be a god in any league he ever coached in because right. of what he's accomplished. But, uh, you know, I always use this metaphor of, you know, if you were coaching Wayne Gretzky, man, how the hell are you going to tell Wayne Gretzky how to play hockey? How are you going to do that? <laughs> He's Wayne Gretzky. Like he, he's been the best hockey player in the world, you know, so the best coaches he had didn't try and tell him how to play hockey. They tried to make the system work with him. If you're watching the last dance on ESPN with Michael so Jordan. Good. So good. Yeah. And, the, and I love it. I've read books about Phil Jackson and that team, but Phil Jackson understood how to get Michael Jordan to understand you need the players around you to be good and you need to rely on them and build that team. He's another great team bonding advocate. You know, that's what coaching is at really every level, but at the pro level, you really have to adapt that, you know, how are you going to tell Michael Jordan how to play basketball? <laughs> what to <laughs> you know, do and what not to do. That's not how it works. Yeah. Right. Well, and this is really the problem with like LeBron James in a lot of ways. Not that I have any problem with him, but that's the pro he, you, coaches come and go with him because they're not it's, getting it. It's almost every you know? season. It's a new coach because, Hey, exactly. I'm on the show. I'm yeah. LeBron. And, 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 and here's what he's the, thing. he's, he's the, he's the best player in the game today. I don't want to get in an argument of all time or anything like that, but like, you know, you got to know that when you're coaching this guy, yeah, he's probably going to call out of the shots because he's the best player. So uh, again, these are some of the dynamics that go into it. I mean, uh, you know, uh, one last example, I mean, Ovechkin's a great example. When, when Barry Trotz got in there, he knew exactly how to get the best out of Ovechkin. That's the, the year they won the cup, the caps won the cup. Uh, that's still the best I've ever seen him play both sides of the ice because Barry Trotz got the absolute best out of him. He was able to motivate him and the rest of the team surrounded him in a way that was conducive to winning. As soon as he left, you could see the caps last year just did not have the same energy uh, under, under Trotz that last year that they did. So it, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, again, the dynamics when you look at pro youth and college, uh, you really have to have a shift in your, your thinking to survive. Yeah, have, have, KP, have we given our complaints on Todd Reardon as a coach compared to Barry Trotz on this podcast? Yes, we have. <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of what we're hitting has to do with that win book. So let's, let's kind of go through both of these books you said. I mean, if you're watching on YouTube, you got Think Like a Fan. We'll go through this one first. This one's very interesting. Um, kind of a short read, a quick read. What is it, about 140 pages? Uh, so kind of give us a quick rundown on this book, and then we'll kind of grill you on a couple questions regarding some NHL teams <laughs> and fan engagement and even at the youth level. Yeah, sure. So uh, that book was actually based off my master's thesis, which I wrote in uh, graduate school, which is a, essentially about how to build a fan base in the digital era. Um, and again, mostly in sports. And the the, the uh, examples I give in that book <clears throat> hark back to my years with the Peterborough Phantoms, because I also did uh, marketing for the team for most of the time I was there. The first year I was there, I did only marketing. Um, and how to understand how fan bases of anything, not just sports teams, but businesses, uh, that loyalty that they have is really your greatest asset. And the book goes into how to utilize that and to really uh, embolden your fans to promote your team because without them, uh, you really don't have a team. And, you know, it's funny, the story in there that I tell about the Phantoms is when I got to Peterborough in England, they had maybe 200 people show up a game. Right. And these people hated the team. They just, they, you know, because the team was bad. And they hated <laughs> the team. Um, and I remember the owners saying, well, like, no, the fans are horrible. And I said, that's your best asset, man. And they, and they were like, what do you mean they can't stand us? I said, they love you. They just don't realize it. That's I said, why that's they can't stand you. Yeah. I said, hatred is passion. That, you know, I said, look, I'm from Philadelphia. I used to tell them this. Nobody hates my sports teams more than people from Philadelphia, right? But God, I forbid, they win, they, God forbid they win something, then it's all hell. Yeah, well, listen, uh, you know, I've got two championships in my life hopefully one day i'll see the orange and black win the stanley cup but uh, it was going that way this year then you know god intervened but uh, you know uh, passion's everything and and like i said the book goes into obviously using social media how to do that but how to utilize those people 
as your greatest asset to build your fan base. And, uh, you know, in the book, I talk about how the fans went from 200 people to a full capacity crowd every single night with a losing team. Uh, when my first year coaching there as an assistant, we won a championship that made it even bigger. But, you know, you don't need to be a winner to bring people in. So it kind of goes into the business side of that um, and alludes at the end towards the team bonding to being pretty important to this as well. But, uh, yeah, that was a fun little write based off of my time in graduate school. And um, it was my first book, and I, just, I still can't believe I'm an author. It's kind of weird to say. <laughs> KP, you got anything on fan engagement or bringing fans in? Um, uh, something I, I took from that. I loved when, when you said, uh, you got to speak with the fans, not at the fans and Absolutely. like really, really just building that trust. And I think, uh, you like when you were in Germany that you used those fans that were diehard fans. Like, I think it was one guy in the stands and you used that picture of him and you're like, you need to build yeah. your fan base around that. And I, I just love that. Cause it's so true. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's funny because I, I know that fan who you're talking about. His name is Jamie Houghton. I'll never forget him because there's this great picture of him standing there just shouting. And the, I can't reiterate this enough. The team was really bad. <laughs> they were really bad. And here's this guy standing out of the crowd shouting. And that's just like, this is all you need to know. This is all you need to know about how to build a fan base and how to keep it going. And what you said was actually, that was the key, the key phrase. If there was one phrase in that book I said I would take out, it's that. It's speak with your audience not at your audience. We're living in a digital age. And after what's going on in the world right now with this pandemic, more people, a massive amount of people are going to get online um, and really get savvy at being digital for the probably the biggest spike in the history of the internet uh, since the recession, right? So if you don't know how to reach those people, talk with those people, not at those people. And I always say like, people don't like it. We're like, Hey, come on down and see our car showcase. And you too can get $500 off your next purchase. Like nobody wants to hear that anymore. It's like, look, Hey, I'm a car salesman. You can trust me. Here's five people that say I'm loyal. Can we, can we have a conversation? I want to tell you why I'm probably a good person to buy a car from. It's a totally different advertisement and it's a totally different connotation. And when you, when you apply this to hockey, you know, I always say that like, you know, owners or I should say marketing departments, if you're ignoring your fans, it's like being in a crowded room of people Someone says, you suck to your face and I hate you killed my friend. And then you just kind of walk out of the room. Like you have to have a conversation. And all we did in Peterborough was I said, what don't you like about the team? That was the first thing I said. How can we make your experience better? What do you want to see? And we listened to a lot of the suggestions. The only thing I never listened to fans on is how the game should be coached or played. Shoot because the puck. We, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we have people for that. We hire people for that. And if they don't do their job, they'll get fired. But when it comes down to like your experience at a game, anything involving your experience at a game, actually not at a game at home, but your experience with this organization that I can make better, I wanted to know. And we listened and we made changes based on that. And it wasn't long before the word got out like, hey, they're really doing stuff over at this team and it's time to come back. Um, you know, a great NHL franchise, this was the Chicago Blackhawks, you know. Uh, you know, back in the 2008 period prior to that, I mean, they weren't even on TV. People don't realize that. They, they had problems getting on TV in the, in the early 2000s. You right. know what I mean? And then uh, their owner passed away and, you know, um, they, they rethought their marketing approach. They got Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves. They did everything right. They won three Stanley Cups. Now it's one of the most popular franchises in the league. Uh, and again, that happened in, in sports. America. Yeah. Yeah. It happened in a very, you know, they, they went from really, really bad to – Stanley Cup champions in three years. And that's pretty incredible uh, when you think about it. So uh, I'll never forget Eddie Olchek being up there saying, fans of Chicago, it's time to come back. Like that was the first outreach. And look at them now. I mean, again, right. they're not great, today, but they're not, nobody looks at the Blackhawks. Like, but they're yeah, marketable. What, and Yeah. Yeah. What a horrible organization. Like nobody <laughs> says that, but they did 15 years ago. They did 15 years ago. You can read about players saying they hated playing at the old Chicago stadium. And that team was a joke, you know, for years. So, um, he, he, again, I remember when I was writing this, I used to say, man, people know this. And my publisher and agent used to say, you, you know, this, not a lot of people know this. And when you look around, look, you guys are in the area. I mean, look at the Washington Redskins right now. Oh. Like, I mean, look, look at how oh. horrible their leadership is. I mean, no, the fans are leaving. And this they is had, the most, one of the, go they ahead. had to go ghost mode on Twitter at towards the end of last season because every yeah. single tweet no matter what they sent every single reply was fire Bruce Allen fire this and they're like we're going off yes. social they acted like a teenage girl going through a breakout they just ghosted social media to stop tweeting yeah. and doing this that and the and other no one's listening no one over there is listening to the fans what do they do they shut them out they did the exact opposite of what they're supposed to do they, they put a wall up so you know what's happening is Redskins fans are leaving that team 
really fast. I thought there was a glimmer of hope when the DC defenders came with the XFL, but now that's gone. Right. So it's, it's one of those things of like, you know, this is one of the proudest franchises in the history of the national football league. Again, I know this is a hockey show. Sorry to go off topic, but it's, it's a, it's a great example of a team. This is how quickly you can lose your grip on this. The fans don't feel listened to. You've made horrendous decisions in an organization and you're not marketing to your, there's no reason for a Redskins fan to want to go to that building right now. Now with that said, they will probably turn around at some point. Okay, yeah, the it's, it's the worst game day experience in the NFL. I would probably say. Well, there you go. Here's and, how we and tie again, it back. The XFL in. team made a beer snake out of cups, and that was right. the biggest. I mean, that's how desperate people are in Washington right now for good for, football, for good sports. Here's how we tie it yeah. back into hockey. I mean, you look at the Skins fans who are like, "I'm not going to the game. I'm not paying attention." But those same exact fans are DC fans, they're Cavs fans, they're Wizards yeah. fans, they're DC Defenders fans, but. And you look at how crazy things got when the Nationals won, when the Caps yeah. won. I mean, they're the same exact fans. I mean, I'm a Skins fan. I'm a Caps fan, a Nationals fan. If you're a D.C. fan, you're a D.C. fan. You could say that for Philly, too. If you're an Eagles fan, you're, you're a Birds fan, you're a Flyers fan. If you're a Flyers fan, you're yeah. a Phillies fan. But those same fans are so involved and so bought into the Caps under Ted Leonsis. It's just kind of like it's just how it's run and how it's presented and everything of that nature. Yeah, well, Leonsis is a great owner. And, and you know, there's the thing. There, there was a time there that the Capitals were, you know, they couldn't get over the hump. Um, and I, I could feel that the fans were starting to lose the a little bit. The tension was yeah. fuck right there. <laughs> I, I would say impatience, right? It was just like, are we going to do this or not? You know, we've got one of the best players of all time. Uh, and then they did it. And look, like, I mean, that's supercharged that. And the Nationals are, you know, you want to talk about team bonds, the oldest average age in the league, and they won the World Series mm-hmm. uh, over a team that was cheating. <laughs> I mean, it's a after it's a, getting their, rid of their superstar and yeah yeah i mean it's like, yeah, it's like i don't want to talk about that yet but yeah no like like okay listen you guys want to say something funny here's the thing quote like, unquote it won't superstar. all you've done is make him mad all you've <laughs> done is make him mad okay he can be as mad as he wants we got our right. ring hey, we got, the got ring. your rings he, he wanted to bring it back to dc ours. quote quote yeah. on harper he wanted to bring it back I, I remember. Don't, don't worry. You can you can you can shirt me all you want. We're gonna win. <laughs> no, but uh, back back to I'll like your guess team, then. <laughs> your, your team bonding thing and talking about like the Nationals. They yeah they were not even on the radar. I don't think for a World Series. Like maybe at the no. during that year they were playing so bad. And then I think it was uh like the Baby Shark thing. They kind of bonded over that. They were dancing and they kind of got that gel, that team love and trust Doesn't in take each much. other. And it, it doesn't take much, man. Yeah, right. I, I always say this. Creating the team bond is actually pretty easy. It's maintaining it. that can be really hard. But it doesn't take much to get a team bonded. Um, that's the easy part. Like I said, maintaining it over the course of a season, that can be hard. Uh, and they did yeah. it, and they came together. And, again, at the oldest average age in professional baseball, and they won the World Series in seven games, that tells you what you need to know. And the other team was cheating. Like, again, you know what I mean? Like, you got to keep yeah. that in mind. Like, like yeah. it's like they overcame that. So, um, and I have no problem admitting that, by the way. I hate that that's not been punished. But anyway, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those things. So kind of last question here I want to ask before we get on to the win book, which is the book we've – I feel like we've already been talking about for the majority of this. <laughs> yeah, well, um, they, 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 they coincide with each other. So a lot of listeners to the show uh, are high school coaches. I mean, here in the DMV area, a lot of the – it, Friday nights are a big deal for high school hockey. Um, for sure. Yeah. Prep league, high, public school league, you name it. Some You go to a rink around here and it's just jumping through the roof. But Isn't sometimes awesome? you go to a Isn't game awesome? and there's not a single fan there in terms of student section. There are specific schools that will have these student engagement, fan engagement. I mean, is there any advice that you may have on that in terms of – I don't think you talk, thought about it in terms of the book or anything, but like – yeah, like, I know the schools in my mind that do a great job in terms of like having students, student sections out. They do pizza nights, they do theme nights. But I mean, what what are your thoughts on like growing that type of fan base? Yeah, I, look, actually, I'll, I'll do it through telling you a story because um, people remember stories. Um, so one of the things, one of the big triumphs outside winning at uh, Montclair when I coached there was the football team, which is an NCAA team at Montclair State, went to the the, the school and complained that the ice hockey team was taking too many fans on, on game days, on Saturdays. <laughs> so you have a football team complaining to the administration that, like, you know, the hockey team's getting all our fans, which I thought was really funny, number one. Um, and also, like, the school, to their credit, was like, that's not our problem. Do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I remember uh, adversely in, Montcl- in, in uh, Peterborough when I was in England, I remember the rink came to us one night and said there's too many people in the building. 
I was like, what do you want me to do? It's your arena. <laughs> so, so the, the, this, this story is like, you know, predecessors, the outcome of that or precedes the outcome. But one of the things I did at Montclair was I would take the team on team jogs once a week and I would run them around campus and I gave them all 10 schedules each and I'd run them through popular areas on campus like the quad or, you know, next to the library. And every player had to hand out a schedule to one of the, one of the students. Um, now, I'm at, I, in high school, I, I can understand this. There's not a quad. There's not a college atmosphere. But I'd say, what are you doing to get your athletes um, in front of the other students? Because it's that connection is what brings people to a game. I mean, I'd say in high school, you might be going to the game because you like hockey, but you're probably going because you know somebody on the team or you're connected to the team in some way. So if you're a high school coach or your high school team uh, or, or player, my question is, what can you do to connect to that student base that's going to make them want to be there on a game night? Um, and, and again, look, little incentives like discounts and stuff are nice, but like the truth is we can get them anywhere. It's the connection. You have to make that connection with the fan base. Um, now, my, my advice to coaches is that, you know, you have to be very smart about this too, because you don't want your, your players going nuts, right? Like you have to do it in a professional way. You have to maintain the integrity of your program. You know, you don't want your players getting in trouble but there's plenty of ways that you can get involved with that fan base. Um, I shouldn't call them a fan base, the student, you know, the students at the school and get them connected to the team and let them know, Hey, you're part of what we're doing here. That's the other side of it is, you know, the players on the team, how can you make the students feel like they're part of the team? Like, is there a student committee? Is there a student fan support group that can raise awareness for the team? Um, do you have a mission that you're sharing with the school of like, Hey, we're going for this, this year, you know, it's our mission to do this. And we want you, the students, to be a part of that because we can't win without you. That's the type of stuff that you can use to connect. And then also, I mean, it's 2020. If you're not using digital and social media right. to your advantage at this point, I mean, what are you doing? I mean, with, with TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook's probably a little bit aged out for this, but all of it, you know, if you're not creating those pages and creating those groups and having fun with it um, without, without distracting from the task at hand, I mean, you're crazy. You have to be on these platforms right now to connect. I mean, we see that in business and hockey and everything. So um, those are my suggestions is make a connection, have a mission that everybody can sink their teeth into and then invite them to be part of it. And they'll show up in droves. They will. All right. And that's how you, that's what happened to Montclair. I had them running around with schedules. We gave the schedules out in the quad. The football team didn't want to get near anybody. They were NCAA athletes, right? They didn't want to, they didn't want to be touched and talked to, right? So right. Here, here's the rest of the student body. Hey, we're a winning hockey team. We play hard. We break our faces. You know what I mean? We break bones and we keep playing. Here's a schedule. Come down to the game. It's free. And, you know, within, within a couple of months, we had full crowds at our, at our games. Right. So, you know, made the connection. And you found that every single schedule got passed out to a girl somehow. But, uh, you know what? I wasn't <laughs> going to say that, but yes, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, KP, any last questions on kind of fan engagement and that type of stuff before we get to the next book? No, I mean, I mean that's perfect. I, I love it. Yeah, so this one I think is um, – kind of essential to our listeners too. I mean, if you're watching YouTube, you can see it. It's the win book, uh, kind of what every team needs to know to create and win a championship culture. And me and KP kind of have some background in this coaching high school, but kind of what I want to do with this book, I mean, you have 10 chapters here. I mean, each chapter has a different approach to a team. And I kind of just want to run through the, the title of each sure. chapter and kind of how we can help a team, how it can hurt a team and kind of relative expense our experiences. But I mean, the first one is the bond. I mean, we've yeah. talked about that. You got to have a bond with the team. I mean, KP, when we were coaching Riken, it was we coached this prep school group of kids that were so far out from every single other private school here in the D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, Virginia area, you name it, that they just felt like they were isolated and nobody respected them, and that kind of created our bond. I mean, like I said, we we keep talking about bond and this, but uh, what's how really important is that bond to a team? I mean, if you don't have a bond, you don't have a team. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's essential. Like, like, you know, the reason I started with that is because, again, when I was writing this, I realized I, I had to d define what that is. Like, what is the bond? Why is it so important? But what is it? And then really the rest of the book, every chapter after there's a piece of the bond, but the bond is the overall culmination of every other chapter and what uh, the, the end result is and essentially teaches people in the book, this is what we're going to be striving for. But the bond is essentially the ability for everybody on a team, no matter the environment, to respect each other, to understand that they're striving towards a common goal and that they're going to commit to each other to accomplishing that goal no matter what. And then, you know, and again, I, I don't want to jump in, but things like trust, which I believe is the next chapter, is the, mm -hmm. is the foundation for that. But 
I'm going to say this again, and I said it earlier. If you have not established a bond on your team, you will not win. No team has ever won without it. I have never seen an example of a team that won that did not have a bond. So it's, it's not my thought. This is a truth in sport and in any team environment. No one has ever won without some form of bonds there. And the teams that take the time to create this bond, maintain this bond, and commit to this bond will find success very, very fast. All right. Again, most teams that I've worked with have turned around within one year. Uh, I'm not saying so much that they've won a championship the next year. Some of them have. But I'm saying they have gone from a dire situation to being a championship caliber team within one season, every single team I have worked with and implemented this with. So it, it is not just something I'm selling here. I believe in this with all of my being. Uh, I've said before, I believe in this concept like I believe in religion. Like that's, that's how closely I follow my belief in team bonding. Sure, KP. I mean, just, just going back to the, the trust thing, I mean, is, is there, was there a time that I guess you saw where maybe you saw another player not trusting one guy or you saw a guy kind of like as an outsider where, where you kind of had to step in and like maybe get that trust back or something like that? Uh, you know, like I said before, most of my philosophy has been built off of what coaches and players have done, in my opinion, in your- wrong you know, over the, over the course of my life. And I've seen so many, and I'm sure you guys have too, and everybody listening, I've I've been in so many situations where trust was lost or a coach was not following his own rules or players were getting preferential treatment or players were lying to each other. Um, You know, and when you really break down trust, I mean, it is the, the, the absolute consummate foundation for every successful relationship you have with another human being. You know what I mean? If you don't trust your spouse, if you, <laughs> if you don't trust your team, uh, right. you're going to have real problems. I mean, and, and really where this stems from, and the greatest team on the planet is the, the military. I mean, these are people that have to trust each other with their lives. I mean, literally their lives, because someone will get killed if that's not happening. You know, so I looked at military tactics and how they build trust and why it's important. And in the book, I really define the word. And, you know, one of the questions I always ask people is, and I'll ask you two right now, I'll put you on the spot, is can you define the word trust without using trust in the definition? KP, you want to go first or you want me to do it? Uh, yeah, I guess the first thing that pops in my head would be respect, respecting respecting another person. I mean, I think the bill, I guess the biggest thing is, is respecting that person. That starts with it, with trust for me, I guess. Yeah, I think if I'm going to put it quite bluntly, as long as you don't fuck me over, then... I can trust you as long as you show promise, you show potential and you show that you're kind of on my team and yeah. trust you. If you're going to put effort in, like you, it's even going back to earlier. I mean, it's, you may not be the best of friends with everybody on your team, but you can respect their work ethic, you respect their habits. As long as they're showing up, I can trust you to do your job. Then it's what it is. I got you. Yeah. And, and it's just the thing. You both gave Similar but different definitions, right? And and Matt, you used you used trust in the definition. I'm calling you out on that, but that's okay. Right? <laughs> um, it, like, like, here's the deal. You know, you both talked about trusting outgoing. Trust is also incoming. They have to trust you as much as you trust them. Now, here's the the crux of this. Everyone has a slightly different definition of this word. Okay, um, and depending on your upbringing and depending on your background, you're going to have a very different definition. So, for example, I work with um, an inner city football team here in Philadelphia. Um, and almost every single player on this team is dealing with a one parent home. If they have a parent at home, right. drugs, uh, uh, murder is a very realistic possibility every single day for these kids. They define trust very differently than I would have when I was 16 years old. All right. So the reason I'm telling you that is because when you bring in 20 people to a hockey team, they're all going to have different definitions of this word. Uh, you know, adversely, if you grew up very well off, and uh, I, don't really, I don't like to say silver spoon, but you haven't wanted for anything, it's going to mean something different for you if you're expecting things all the time. So what happens with teams, and this is why this is the, really the, the first main key of the book, is that if you bring in 20 people to a hockey team, they all have different definitions of the word trust, and trust is the foundation of everything, you are going to collapse like a Jenga set very quickly, right? Because you haven't defined the word. So I asked that, and when you look at it, trust is really more of a feeling, right? It's a feeling you have. It's, it's tough to define because it's more of a feeling. You know when you can trust someone most of the time, right? 
Um, I always use the mailman as the example. I trust the mailman to deliver my mail. I don't trust him to watch my kids. There's different levels to trust too, mm -hmm. right? So the first thing I do with the team is I define communally what does this word mean to all of us because that's the standard we need to follow for the rest of the season. I've never had a team have the same definition. I've never had a team I've coached multiple years have the same definition. Think about that for a second. So it's, it's an evolving thing. It's something that has to be defined every year. For the coaches listening to this, I, I really uh, suggest you do this. Sit down with the whole team, define the word trust, define that core. What does it mean to trust one another on this team? You know, I always tell this story. It's pretty, pretty uh, dark, but really between the eyes type story. I was talking to a, a combat controller in the Air Force one time who, who is on the front line. They, you know, they see bullets. Let me put it that way. And uh, I, it was a comfortable conversation. I asked him, you know, which you should never ask somebody in the military, how do you go out on a field of battle and do what you do? I don't understand how you can kill people and how, how do you do that? And when the bullets start flying, how do you survive that? And he said two things I'll never forget. I'll never forget this. The first thing he said to me was, Lee, anyone who tells you they've been in battle and wasn't scared is full of shit. That's the first thing you need to know, right? Like I'm scared every time I go out there, know that. I'm not afraid to admit that. I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's big. Then the second thing he said changed my life. He said, it's real simple. Every time I go on the battlefield or every time I'm in a firefight, I just assume I'm going to get killed and I try and save the guy next to me and every single one of us does that. And I, that hit me between the eyes. Yeah, that's um, a... You know, this guy's going out there just expecting to die. He's going to die for his brothers and sisters. And he knows every one of them would do that for him. And that's how they survive the battle. When you put that in a context of a hockey season, you know, where sacrifice in the military means the ultimate sacrifice. Sacrifice in hockey means you might get hit with a puck. You know what I mean? Um, if you can't commit to each other after hearing that story, something's wrong with the culture of the locker room, right? They're willing to die for each other. I need to know when I'm in a locker room that the person next to me is doing every possible thing they can for the team. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. It's the commitment is if you make a mistake, are you going to do everything you can to correct that mistake? Right? I said this too. I don't care if the goalie puts the puck in his own net if he's trying his hardest to win. Now, that's a very weird scenario, but it does happen, <laughs> believe it or not. But that really changed my thinking. You know, these guys trust each other with, with their lives. If you can't trust the person in the locker room next to you, you will not win. You will not win. It's not possible. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And then, I mean, that even leads us into building an identity. I mean, how yeah. important is it for a team to have that identity? I mean, because like I said, I talked about it already, me and KP coaching the team. I mean, my first – I coached two seasons as a head coach for a prep school down here in Maryland. First season was a – we had one regular season win a year. Second season, we go our first conference championship and first state championship in school history. And I can That's tell awesome. you that we didn't change a single thing in terms of on ice. Yeah. Everything was off ice. It's, I mean, the first day was like, what kind of team do we want to be? It's like, ah, let's, let's be the underdogs, a team that nobody gives a shit about and that they're overlooking and we'll, we'll fight from the bottom and go from there. And, I mean, how important is it, is it to set that exact team identity – I mean, at the beginning of the season, midway through the season, but it kind of helps mold a team into who they are. Yeah, the, the beauty of identity is that every team has a new identity every year, right? And it doesn't matter if, if all the same players are back on the team, there's a new identity every year. So it's just kind of finding it and establishing it. And, and that's the trick with identity is figuring out what makes you who you are. So when I walk into a team and I go, okay, what do we want to do this season? We want to win, coach. I'm like, yeah, I, I, everyone wants to win. Yeah. That's not an identity. It's like, I, I know you want to win. Who are you and why do you want to win? Who are you as a team? Are you the gritty underdog, like you said? Are you fighting for a teammate that has cancer? Are you a team that is supposed to win this year and it's your time to win? Are you a team that's won five years in a row and you must maintain the legacy? Uh, whatever it is. There's identity everywhere. Are you, is your school an identity, right? Are you fighting for your school, for your city, for your state, for your country, all right? Obviously, that's an identity at the national level, right? Um, haven't quite got to the intergalactic uh, global scale yet for fighting Space for the planet. But... Yeah, it, it, is, it is Star Wars Day, by the way. May the 4th be with that's you. True. Big fan. Um, but finding what makes your team unique. And, you know, if you're saying to yourself, well, there's nothing really that makes us unique, then you're failing, <laughs> You have to, of course, there's something that makes you unique. There's got to be a reason why you're fighting for each other. Um, and, and like I said, 
some of those are built through tragedy, which is always horrendous. You know, I remember when um, Las Vegas went to the cup final, uh, there was a massive shooting, massive yeah. shooting in Las Vegas at the start of that season. And the team really bonded over that and their fan base. And I think that's one of the main reasons they spurred themselves all the way to the final that year. Now, obviously them at the caps who had a mission of their own. Um, so <clears throat> identity not, doesn't mean you'll win all the time. Um, but like I said, I give the Knights a lot of credit for really surrounding that. If you look at the Philadelphia Flyers this season, Oscar Lindblom got mm -hmm. diagnosed with cancer and, you know, the team really suspiciously started winning like crazy after that happened because they were able to bond. It was a human level. Now I'm not saying, by the way, no one should be rooting for tragedy or right. anything like that. And I'm not saying that when <clears throat> tragedies happen, you should be like, Ooh, yeah. like, that's not what I'm trying to say. But you right, can but I'm saying that, the team yeah. that embraces it and yeah, builds well, off of it. Well, yeah. It's a human thing. Like, and yeah, helps. What are we doing it. here? Right. It's a human thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, why, why are we here? Why, why do you want to win? Because I'm not convinced that you want to win by just telling me that you want to win. Everybody wants to win. Why must you win or succeed? What's the true fire the to make you want to win? Exactly. That you have to find that identity. You have to identify the identity sure. of the team. And again, we can build off this. If you all trust each other and then you <laughs> find that identity, like think about how strong you are, you are now. I don't even think, I think that's just chapter three. Right. Ten yeah. chapters in this book. Right. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Uh, the next one we have up is uh, is accountability. Is that more yeah. on a, a personal, like do do your job, like in New England, or are you you bringing it both like personal and the team accountability? Talk about that. Uh, it's all levels. So it, it, when you think of accountability, and especially with youth teams, although I, this is something I talk about a lot with pro teams too, accountability. It, it, there's levels to it, right? So the lowest level is this: is it's you screwed up, you screwed up, right? And we've all been on teams where you have a player that says it's your fault, right? As you go up the ladder, it might turn into something like, you know, hey, you screwed up, and maybe I could have done more, but you screwed up, right? Then you get to this level of, you know, hey, we screwed up, right? Eventually, the top level of this is a problem occurred. How can my team solve this problem, right? It's the difference between an athlete that blames everybody else and an athlete that finds solutions. If you look at, and we talked about Jordan before, if you look at the greatest teams in history, they're self-taught teams. And what I mean by that is if you can get your players to an accountability level where they make a mistake, and this is tough in high school, but again, it's tough in all levels. They make a mistake and their first thought is how do I correct my mistake so it doesn't happen again? If they're doing that, that's an accountable person. Keeping in mind too that coaches set the bar for this. As a coach, you must be accountable. You must follow your own rules. All right. You can't set the rules for the team and then break them. That's not accountable. It's not trustworthy. Right. So I try and encourage my players with that. Of, I need you to be accountable. If you make a mistake, I don't need you to tell me it's someone else's fault or yell at somebody. I need to find a solution as a group. And again, I'll go back to the goalie putting the puck in his own net. Right. If you lost the game four to three and within the last second, the goalie accidentally puts his puck in, the, in his net. Are you the player that's going to say the goalie screwed us? If you didn't do that, we would have we would have won. Or are you the player that says, you know what, it was a 60-minute game and there's a lot of moments in the game that could have changed the tide of this game. And it's always easy to look at the last play. It's always easy to look at the play in overtime or something like that. Or I, I'll give a positive example for you guys. When Holpe made the most incredible save in the history of hockey yes, when the you. Caps won, right? Huge save. And I'm not downplaying the save, okay? But that save was the cherry on top of a 60-minute effort. It wasn't right. the reason that the Caps won the Cup. All right. It was actually the cherry on top of the season, but in, 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 in reality, it was a very small, but big, but small moment or small play uh, in, in the context of the entire game season, however you want to look at it. The accountable person would look at everything the Capitals did correct that game that year to get them to that point. Right. So it's trying to create that accountability level of uh, we, not me and self-taught again. I like to say to players, you're allowed to make a mistake. Everyone here is allowed to make a mistake. If you make the same mistake twice, I get annoyed. You make it three times, I get pretty pissed off. You make it four times, you might not be in that position much longer. You know what I mean? I, I, I need you to be accountable and, and work hard to get better at whatever it is. Now, the next one that kind of interests me that I kind of want to ask you a question about is leadership. And I think a way that a lot of coaches approach this is, I mean, you have, you have different options. I mean, am I going to make my best player the captain? I got yeah. high school. Am I going to make my seniors the captain or the NHL? Am I going to make my Stanley Cup veteran the captain? 
is there a certain approach to go about approaching leadership? I mean, I can tell you from example, I mean, KP, we were in Notre Dame. We had a, I guess KP is going to get to it next, but we had a cancer on the team, a uh, senior yeah. uh, quote unquote leader. Didn't get along with a lot of players. We're going to intermission after one of the games. He starts just rating, rating one of the players on the team for playing a shitty game up to that point. And uh, a sophomore steps up and just kind of lays into him, you know, just gets in front of the whole team and just puts this kid down that nobody yeah. had kind of the balls to do. So I immediately go to the coach and yeah. I'm like, you got any uh, letters in your bag? He goes, why? I was like, ah, just curious if you have an A in there. <laughs> so after that game, I, you know, I take the A and just give it to that kid. I'm like, here you go. Everybody respects that. But how should approach – a coach, I should say, approach leadership. Um, should they do it right at the beginning of the season? Should they do it immediately after the previous season ends? I mean, what should they really be looking for? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about captaincy, I mean, it depends on the team and the situation. I mean, there's really no right way to do it. I can just give you my thoughts and that I believe that awarding the captaincy or, or earning the captaincy, I should say, is something that the coach should decide. I don't, I personally, and again, I'm not knocking anybody who does this, but I'm not, I personally don't like it when teams allow the players to vote a captain. I think that's the incorrect way to do it. Huh. Um, the captaincy is a very important role it is it is essentially the middle ground between the players and the coaching staff. And that person has to provide the communication between both ends in addition to leading the team on the ice or on the field, if you will. So I think when you look at captaincy, um, you know, cause people ask that, well, should it be the seniors? Should it be the best player on the team? These are old things we subscribe to. And I don't know why. Now with that said, I understand why seniors should be captains when they're seniors, because they've been with the team for three or four years, um, and you're seniors and juniors, and they probably earned an amount of respect there, but this is something you should start grooming when they're freshmen. Uh, you know, you don't just become a leader. You, 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 I'm sorry. You don't, you don't just get become a leader overnight with a snap of your fingers. This is something you learn through time. I remember my freshman year in college, the year we won that championship, we had a hulking captain. He was six foot five, big dude. And I really looked up to this guy, literally and figuratively. Um, and I remember what they were, the press was with him. It was a big playoff game and the press was interviewing him. And they said, you know, what does it mean to be a captain tonight? And he said this, and I never forgot this. He goes, I need everyone to be a captain tonight. He goes, I might be wearing the letter, but the truth is everyone needs to be a leader tonight, not just me. And that really summed it up for me that, you know, the C is an honor. It's an honor to be a captain. I've been a captain myself. It's an honor. But everyone is part of that leadership because if people don't listen to the captain and the captain doesn't listen to the players, it, it's really just an, an empty letter. You know what I mean? It has to mean more than that. And again, th with the coach and the captain, a captain is only as powerful as the coach lets them, and the coach is only as powerful as the captain lets them be. It's, it's a mutual relationship. You know what I mean? I think that's something a lot of coaches miss. It's not just the thing you throw out. So again, to answer your question – it's something that I think that, you know, the person that is got that C should have the maximum effort level on the team. And again, you can start grooming people for this early on, should portray the maximum effort on and off the ice and should really portray the standard. This is the key, the standard that you want your team to have. If you pick the best player and they're out screwing off and they're not treating their players with respect, that's kind of what you're going to get. And you're going to get, like you said, Notre Dame, a guy's going to stand up and scream in the locker room. Now, while I respect that, it's probably not the best environment to do that. It probably fractured the team, right? And then all of a sudden, you, you might have a lot of players that like one guy and a lot of players that like another guy, and that's not really what you want. You want everyone bonded in the same group. So, again, leaders should teach leaders. Um, if you're a 15-year-old freshman, you should be looking up to the 18-year-old captain. The 18-year-old captain should be wanting to teach these freshmen how to be good leaders um, when they get to that time. But everyone needs to be a leader. And, again, going back to it, if trust is there – and you're accountable players, your leadership should actually take care of itself as long as you're establishing that the leader embodies those, those things. Sure. So there's kind of a sneak peek, I mean, at the win book. Coaches, like we said, go get it. KP, you got one more question to ask on, and then we'll start to get into some, some of these companies. Um, yeah, I think in, the, in that book as well, uh, you talked about adversity. And mm -hmm. to me, I guess what comes to mind with it when I played is like uh, maybe you lose to a team and then getting that bounce back win against them and building that confidence to kind of build off that. Um, so what, what do you go into in the book about adversity? Yeah, I, I think adversity is one of the best teachers in sport um, and teams that are prepared to deal with adversity tend to find a way to overcome it. So I, one of the things I talk about is when a team is most vulnerable, and this is always surprising. Most, most people get half of it. I say, well, when's the team most vulnerable? Well, during a losing streak. Uh, which is true. You know, when you're losing a lot, you're very vulnerable and you, you got to figure out how to get out of the losing streak. 
but you're is equally vulnerable during a winning streak. I mean, you know, and for those of you listening, how many of you out there have been on a team that's won 10 games in a row? You lose one and everything falls apart. Uh, everything falls apart because you were not prepared for that moment, right? Um, I don't like it when teams go, well, we're not talking about the winning streak because, you know, we're, we're not going to talk about it. Like, you should absolutely be talking about it, right? You should be absolutely talking about that. This will end at some point, most likely, <laughs> depending, on, depending on the situation. Right? Some right. teams do go on to see all right, but this, this may end, and if it ends, we're going to continue to go business as usual. We're not going to doubt ourselves. It's very hard to go undefeated, okay? If we do, it's a great accomplishment, but going undefeated is not what we're going for. We're going to win. Uh, same thing with losing. When you're losing, it's like usually the reason teams get on losing streaks is because they're asking the wrong questions. Well, how do we get out of this losing streak? That's not the right question. You should be looking at the game. What is it that you need to change about your game to win? <laughs> so when it comes to adversity, it's a great teacher. Um, I, I, every, I, I've always loved that, that quote. I never lose. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I never, uh, yeah, I never lose. I win or I learn. I love that quote. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's great. Cause it's, it's true. It's, it's, what are you going to do with that adversity to teach you? How are you prepared for that adversity? What off ice uh, training have you done to put your team in a position to face adversity and overcome it? Again, this is something that can be learned. You know what I mean? So um, it's not something that should be run from. And again, in youth hockey, it's at all levels, but again, the younger you go, the less experience you have with this. But if you're looking at a high school team, high school is adversity. I mean, the whole thing is adversity, right? Yeah. So the, the, these kids are dealing with it every day already. <laughs> you know, it, it, they're very moldable. You know, teach them about it. Don't stay silent on it. Teach them about that. And this, this all goes into that 30% of team bonding I'm talking about. Are you having these conversations with your team, all right? You know, and, and you know, with no cell phones, are they looking at you and listening? And are you having these life building conversations? The game is a vehicle for life. And I can't stress that enough that, you know, all these tips and stuff in the book, they're all great for hockey and they're all great for sport. But the truth is they're all life lessons. I face adversity in life. I want to trust the people I work with. I need people to be accountable at my work. <laughs> you know, it's all the same, same thing. Cause it's all teams. The team environment is everywhere. So I hope that answers your question, but uh, it, it is a great Definitely teacher. Does. Yeah. And I, I would say embrace adversity embrace the times that are rough because they teach you how to be great. Sure. So like we said, we're not going to spoil the entire book for everybody. Go read it. I read it. We got a copy. Uh, think it. like a fan <laughs> and win. <laughs> but uh, so you got the hat on KP just ordered one KP. I know you got a couple questions about wraparound hockey there. Um, yeah. I guess the main thing is how did the idea get started? Let, let's yeah. start with that. That's an easy one, right? So uh, the idea actually generated when I was living in the United Kingdom in England, uh, me and another male military spouse, we do exist. Um, we're both hockey players and we kind of had this thought, it was kind of introduced of like, what happens if we wrap something on the hockey stick? Um, now, f rewind back to the mid nineties. Um, my dad took me to a hardware store and we got a big piece of sheet metal and we put WD-40 on it. And that was my first shooting pad, right? It was loud, it was clunky. I had to oil it up before every time I shot. Uh, but this predates shooting pads, which are completely out there with, you know, synthetic ice now everywhere uh, by maybe 15 years. Um, and the very first wraparound was actually a piece of steel wrapped around the stick. And it, it, it accomplished it. We wanted to create something where I could use my ice hockey stick outside without fear of damaging the stick, right? So the first version did that. Again, it was loud and clanky because it was steel, but it got, the, it got the gist of it down. And within a year, uh, we engineered and we took a lot of time engineering the, the current version of it, which is made out of a privately formulated plastic. Um, I mean, we, we did like lots of science. Let me just put it that way. If, you, if, if, if I could put <laughs> yeah. numbers and equations on the screen, we did a lot. It's not just a piece of plastic. We put a lot of time into developing that. Me and my business partner, Matt Eastman, um, who is somebody I trust with my life. Um, you know, we developed the kind of plastic version of it and we released that and it went global within two years. I mean, because it's a, it's a solution, right? It, it, it lets you play outside with the stick you play in games with, which is something I always wanted as a kid. Not to mention, it makes the game more accessible, which is really our mission, um, is that, you know, we want everyone to have the ability to play hockey, and this lets you play anywhere. You don't have to have a bad street hockey stick and a good ice hockey stick. You can play outside. It, it, it does not hinder your game at all. And, again, we're six years in now. We sell it. We're sold completely around the world. Um, again, super fortunate, super blessed to be in that position, but um, it's a great team that we've built here that works for wraparound. And again, going back to think like a fan, we are completely customer centric, meaning that like we've built the company off our fan base. We want to know what you like, what you don't like, you know, what needs to be better. 
you know, um, how was your experience? Like we're constantly communicating with them every day to try and make the best possible product. And I really think that's one of the reasons we found success. Well, I think uh, something you said about the product, uh, I think it was actually in a, in a, one, of the, one of the speaking uh, things you did at a convention or something like that. You talked about how Pavel Barber, he's one of the biggest social media guys, kids follow him yeah. that are playing street hockey. He reviewed your product and he, he was honest about it. He said he might not use it. And you love that because you can, you can use that and feedback where another company might be negative towards that comment and not like that comment. You kind of build on that and grow off that. Yeah. Yeah, so Pavel Barber, who's, who's really been great uh, at hockey and, and obviously his role in the game, not just as an influencer, but as a stick handling specialist. We sent him one and we, we just, like you said, asked him, be honest. And he said in his review that, look, I, I wouldn't use this because I like my ABS, which is just a street hockey stick. He goes, but, and this is the thing I love. He said, you can trust these guys. This does exactly what they say it will do. It is a solution. And I love that. He didn't need to endorse it for me. He just needed to tell people, look, we're not BSing anybody. We are exactly who we say you can trust us. That was worth more to me than him saying, this is the best product I've ever used and blah, right. blah, 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 you know, which would have right. been dishonest. So um, that was meant more to me where a lot of, uh, I know I can tell you this, a lot of other companies would have been asking like, hey, this is not cool. Take this down. We don't right. want to see this. Yeah, we, we didn't pay him or anything for that. We just sent it to him. He, and he gave an honest review and, and that's the review that came out. And, and like I said, we've sent him every version we've had since then, uh, just because as a thank you for that. But right. we do that all the time. We, and we, when we send the wraparound out, we say, just give us an honest review. And obviously, uh, if you have an issue with it, if something happens, if it, if it somehow breaks by accident, which does happen once in a million years, contact us because that's not right, right? Like we, we, we do, I'm not selling this, but we do have a 30-day guarantee on it for a reason, right? We, we don't want anybody right. to be upset with the production of it. Um, but like, again, it's been a wonderful experience dealing with all these people, not just the influencers, but the average hockey player or the mom that comes to me and says, you've saved us so much money by not <laughs> right. having to buy 200 or $300 sticks every, every two weeks. Like, uh, you know, I would say this from a parent point of view, it's like you're saving money. All right. Your, your kid's not going to be out there with his, with his Bauer ADV stick, putting another hole in it. Right. And then from the player point of view, it's like, look, and, and I mean this, like I'm a player, I'm a coach. I want to play with the same stick all the time. I don't want right. to be switching sticks, yeah. switching curves. Like, like basketball players walk around with the ball all the time. Football players have the ball all the time. Baseball players have the ball all the time. I want my stick all the time. That's what it was. In fact, side story, in high school, I believed in that philosophy so much because uh, it was all wooden sticks back then. I sawed uh, part of a shaft. And I used to walk around the school with a half a piece of shaft in my hand all the time just so I was holding a hockey stick all the time, which I made, got made fun of relentlessly for, but I didn't care. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I thought I was doing the right thing. And um, I remember I, I'd walk around the hallways just, just stick handling all the time. Um, so this, this gives the solution of that problem of playing outside on any rough surface or any surface. Uh, we've done some funny advertisements where like we play on grass just to show you, you can do it literally anywhere. Right. Except show KP's video of him shooting a puck into his phone. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I, like I know John, John Chavo is a guy. He's, he might not be the most popular uh, pro player, but he, he's had a different career path. I mean, pro roller hockey, and he, he promotes the product. I see him using it, and he's a big street hockey guy. Yeah, John's another guy, you know, stick handling specialist. He has some of the best right. hands in the game, I mean, by far. And, you know, we, we, uh, we were close, and we gave him one, and he was doing all of his tricks with it. And what was great about that, John's a, a, a you know, hardcore SPHL player, plays in Huntsville. He won a championship there. He's also a, a national USA hockey player for inline. has won gold medals for this country. Um, I remember when he got one, he started doing all of his tricks. And he does some, some crazy stuff with the puck. Yeah. But he did it with the wraparound on. It was cool for me because, like, like I, I, this is going to sound weird. I'm a fan of my product, right, obviously. But yeah. to see someone like that doing all the tricks with it on there, I'm like, this thing really works. <laughs> like four yeah. years in, like, it really does what we say it does. And again, like, I know that might sound funny, but no, like, that's kind of awesome. how committed we are. You know, like, 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 we're excited to see things like that. Everybody's picking it up and flipping it. He did a really cool video. You can check it out on our YouTube channel. Like, we put a GoPro on the stick, uh, and you can yeah. see it from the stick's point of view. <laughs> it's just, but uh, yeah, you, you know, there, there's a, that's a lifelong hockey guy right there. And, you know, I wish him the best of luck in his career. I hope he can keep moving up and, uh, he's really dedicated to the game and helping kids grow as well. He's been a great ambassador for, for hockey. Sure. So KP kind of last one we'll ask him about, and I think it kind of ties into uh, 
I know KP listens to a couple. I think you have a couple podcasts, but we live hockey. Yeah. It's kind of a community for people to come and tell stories. And yeah, KP, anything out of that? I mean, when I kind of looked into it, it kind of just felt like you're trying to build like a social media platform with the hockey community, which I love. Um, like, is is that what your goal is to become like a social media platform, or what? What is the idea with that? Yeah, so we love hockey spawned from something I was doing at Wraparound. So I, w- I wanted to build kind of a community at Wraparound, but I realized that as long as there was a brand name behind it, it's going to sound like I'm trying to sell something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I wasn't trying to accomplish that. You know what I mean? As much as I want my brand name out there, I didn't want the audience to think I'm just inviting you to the conversation to try and sell you something. So I made an entirely new company that was basically there just to share hockey stories and build a hockey community of like-minded hockey people that love the game more than anything outside their families meaning that like you're allowed to be a fan of any team you want but i don't want you cursing someone out because they like the islanders or something like that you know what i mean um that's not the type of family we're looking for and that community grew so quick and so good and then we were able to tell some really unique hockey stories we went with uh, hall of famer brian trottier uh, to a place called kitimat to deal with the heisland nation uh to bring hockey to that to that that uh, native community which was up near Alaska. And then adversely, I was just on Long Island with a group trying to build rinks in Long Island. And I was with Mark Messier, Mike Richter. And I got name dropping totally right now, but like, Wait, drop know, them all. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ron Francis was there. And we, we, I mean, you, these are on YouTube or our Facebook channel. You can see them. They're not, you know, they're completely free, obviously. Um, and, you know, share these unique st- hockey stories that you're not seeing. Right. And then from that, we spawned a podcast called the We Live Hockey Podcast, which is interviews with guys like Lou Vero, who is the godfather of USA Hockey, um, and Brian Trache and uh, Kerry Frazier, the most famous ref of all time. Um, and just to tell these unique hockey stories that you've never heard before. Um, and some of the names we've got there, I mean, I've got pictures sitting down with these guys and me podcasting with them, which is incredible. Um, recently, uh, since the pandemic hit, um, you know, we, again, we have this massive audience that follows us. So I started going live on Facebook every Wednesday night. I just called it Puck Drop Live. And I started doing it around 8 o'clock, which is like when games would start. Um, and we, that's our podcast now. So every week I have a new topic. And I try and find like unique things. So one of them that you guys would love was I talked about, uh, you know, why Ovechkin will possibly break that goal record. You know, we talked about well, how great Alex Ovechkin is as a player, right. as a Flyers fan, as complimenting him. Uh, we talked about why fighting needs to be in the game. Uh, we, we just do all these, these topics. And I let, I let our fan base vote on the topic. And then I, I really, I'm a nerd, right? I dive really deep into the research of these topics and really try and provide that information back to the fan base. And they've really loved it and they appreciate it. Uh, it's been a cool escape for me, but I get a lot of people. We have listeners from Australia. <laughs> it's like, like um, you know, they, they really love, really love the stuff that we're doing. And I love the interaction with the fan base. And, um, I can tell you this now. Actually, this is a secret. Nobody knows this. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll give you guys the breaking news on this. When will this air? Tell me when this will air. Give me an idea. When this uh, probably next week or the week after the latest. All right, perfect. Uh, I have a new kind of thing coming from this. I'll just tell you that it's going to be on hockeyrewards.com. Okay. If you're listening to this, it is completely going to be free, and it's going to be just free giveaways for – people loving the game of hockey and we know no, you love free stuff listeners yeah there you go and, and again this is not there are brands involved but it's not a brand affiliated entity if you know what i'm trying to say meaning like we have to have brands involved so we can give stuff away but basically if you come to this site and you want to play hockey do hockey trivia or anything if you do any of that you're entered in to win a prize right so it's going to be at hockeyrewards.com again I, i'm telling you guys no one knows about this chirping the the exclusive it is it really is like i said i figured like this might be the one i'm going to say it hockeyrewards.com completely free you can win great hockey prizes with great hockey people and we're trying to build this community out uh into something even bigger now so we live hockey is kind of building that um and hockey rewards was available which i couldn't believe (laughs) as a name Uh, and it's going to culminate everything that we talked about in the show from team building and everything into one space where we can kind of keep growing that community together. So I, I am totally selling that in the sense I want you to check it out. But again, it's free. Oh, it's, love it. it's for you. It's for you people. Check it out. Right. 
Because if you listen to this, you're a hockey player or a fan. So it's guaranteed. Yeah. It's been an awesome interview. Let's end it with this. Uh, let's just kind of talk about. I mean, you're a Philly guy. The Flyers were arguably the hottest team in the NHL. They beat the wheels off the Caps twice before oh, hurts. everything got yeah. ended. It was a potential deep run. There still is the possibility. I mean, what were your thoughts on the Flyers? And then what's your thoughts on how this season may end or what's going to happen here? So here's the thing with the Flyers. Um, our previous coach, Dave Haxtall, is the first coach we've had that I could not stand. And I don't want to knock Dave Haxtall because I think he's actually a brilliant hockey mind, but he had no ability to find an identity for this team. And when you look at the Flyers, when our owner Ed Snyder died, uh, any semblance of an identity died with him meaning that you know, we were the Broad Street Bullies for so long, and we had this aura of toughness, and when he died, that went away. Um, well, to be and, fair, didn't you guys yeah. throw the Snyder bracelets like on the ice? Onto the yeah. ice, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It literally <laughs> that, That's died where it that. died, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like I said, that was disgusting, but at the same time, it's Philadelphia. It makes Prideful, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, so um, we were kind of hovering there with no identity and like, like, like I'll be full. I'll fully admit like the broad street bullies mentality doesn't work in the modern NHL. Um, and you know, what's happened here is we have completely found that identity again. Um, our coach has completely helped them figure that out. Uh, you know, Elaine Vigneault has always been a master at doing that. And he's got this team really bonded. And the team has said that this is the most bonded team they've ever played on. And it, they were completely hitting stride. And it's the most excited I've been for the Flyers probably since 2004. And I'm like, man, we have a real shot with this team. Carter Hart, we finally have a goaltender that is good enough. And we're going to do it. And then they shut down the NHL, which is exactly what would happen when the Flyers got good. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, I don't think that what's happening is going to stop that bond. I think the Flyers are going to be back to prominence for a while, mainly because if you look at the, the, at the suspects here, we have a really strong goaltender, one of the best in the league. Right. If anyone thinks Carter Hart's not coming up and he's going to be a Vesna candidate soon, uh, you're, 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 you're just biased. I mean, he's in, barring injury, he's clearly going to be one of the best goalies in the league very soon. All right. Or barring the Flyers organization doesn't screw that up. All right. Uh, not to mention that, you know, we have a really young core, we have really good players. Um, this is a window for the Flyers to really jump in and win. Now, I, I have no idea what's going to happen when the season continues, if it continues, in terms of the Flyers or any team for that matter, because this is such an unknown. It's never happened before. I mean, the optimist in me is, hey, if they pick up where they left off, it's going to be pretty right. good. you know. Yeah. Um, but, but who knows, right? Winning the Stanley Cup is very, very hard to do. Only one team does it a year. I know people go, that's obvious. Have you really thought about that? It's 31 teams. Only one team is going to win it. It's not easy to do. You know what I mean? It's not easy to do. Um, but I'm looking forward to the future. I, I really think the Flyers have a bright future. The uh, Penguins are not getting any younger. The Capitals are not getting any younger. You know, and, and you look <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's valid. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the Flyers are kind of that flame rising right now, you know? So it's like, uh, yeah, I'm very excited for the future of the Flyers. And, uh, and above, above all, guys, I mean, we have gritty now. So hey, he is you know, a legend. Yeah, we have the two greatest mascots in sports now in, in Philadelphia, and True. and gritty is all, our pulse, you know. And, and so so that's the real reason we're gonna win one day, because we have <laughs> to see what he would do with the Stanley Cup. Uh, KP, any final questions? Um, <laughs> or gritty or anything? Else? But gritty is I do love gritty. Yeah, as much I mean, as I, I hate guess, the Flyers uh, like, in terms of a fandom standpoint, but gritty is. Uh, He's embodied our city. I <laughs> follow him on like Instagram and everything. He goes live every day. I'm like, I think I heard you know, talk about this on your, one of your podcasts that uh, talking about the integrity of like, if they do bring it back, like that, that team that, that does win this, they don't, they don't want it to be like a five game series. They want it to be that seven game series. You kind of want to keep the aut yeah. authenticity of it and the respect of the game. Like, yeah. Uh, so it, it, this actually harks back to the commissioner, right? So one of the things Gary Bettman said was that if we're going to do uh, finish the 1920 season or the 2019, 2020 season, sounds weird when I say 1920, um, you know, we have to keep the integrity of the game intact. So one of the things I was saying is that, you know, to do that, you must have seven game series in the playoffs. You probably have to have 82 games played because what you don't want, what you want to avoid is any situation where someone goes, yeah, I mean, look, that team won the Stanley Cup, but but if they didn't do this and they played seven game series, then they never would have won. Like, you want to avoid that. I mean, right. if hockey comes back or any sport for that matter, whoever wins is going to be known as, oh, that's the team that won during the pandemic, and th that's okay. I think we'll accept that. 
But I really hate it when people go, well, if the lockout didn't happen, the Chicago Blackhawks never would have won the Stanley Cup because you know, that's the integrity side of it. And again, you're always going to have people that say stupid things like that. But, you know, for an integral final, you really have to finish the season and you have to have the full seven-game, four-round series. Right. I feel like as long as you have that seven-game, four-round series, it's, it's pretty predominant. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think that's amazing. I think people are willing to forgive what's happening right now. And I think the fact that the NHL – is really trying to come back at all. Yeah. It's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big testament to the fans. They could, guys, they could just mail it in and it save the money. But Ovi needs you know, 50 but, goals and yeah. Well, <laughs> did you guys hear today that you know, th- this entire pandemic might be some, some actual underground stuff from Canada just to keep him from hitting that mark? It's, it's <laughs> yeah. potentially everything swirling around. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. gaining traction, but um, you heard we, it here first. No, I'm just kidding. We, we greatly appreciate you coming on, man. It was an awesome talk. It's a lot of insightful stuff. I mean, the books are great. Uh, any, any other things you want to plug some podcasts, some other companies, whatever you want to do. I want to plug you guys for this awesome <laughs> podcast. I mean that and inviting me on and you guys do a great show and you got a following here. And I, I love, uh, I love that it's, it's, you know, the three areas that you're in greatly more than three areas. And I, I love any group of people that's providing something like this. And that you're, you're providing, you have listeners that are loyal to you. I think that's amazing. So I want to promote this podcast on your podcast. You guys are awesome. All the people listening, I want to thank you for listening to me for the last close to an hour and a half. Close enough. <laughs> I, I yeah, appreciate I love, all you. Yeah. Love the conversation, man. Love the story. Uh, hopefully we can keep this relationship going and keep talking to you because, uh, I mean, I love everything you're doing for the game. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that. And sure. if the Flyers do win the Stanley Cup, I'll come back on. And we'll talk <laughs> yeah, we'll it. let you come on. And you and um, our guy from Philly is Flyer, Dan Silver, who we have on to kind of predict or talk Flyers with us. You guys can come on and just bash us all you want. <laughs> no, I won't bash you. I'll just be happy. <laughs> Elias, guys. Everybody check him out. Books, companies, you name it. Great hockey mind. Great guy. Just give it a follow. Give it a listen. And we'll go from there. Lee, thanks again. Thanks, buddy. Have a great night. Bark down. Bar and down. Off the bar and down.